Ahmed Saram, the host of the Arab American television show Bill Ahdan, and means with open arms. And uh, today we open our arms to uh, a writer, a journalist. Uh, we have uh, Shireen Marhabi, is a writer, author, and speaker, and has been, uh, you know, most of her time in the United, United Kingdom and the uh, United uh, uh, Emirates. And, uh, her her uh, duet novel, Jasmine Falling. A lot of layers uh, in, in that novel. Well, first, we'd like to welcome you, uh, Shireen, on our show. I know you are now uh, in uh, in the United Arab Emirates, right? Am I correct? Yes, that's right. I'm in uh, Dubai at the moment. So you are in Dubai in the moment. That means it's nine, ten o'clock in the evening. So we, yeah. we just want to <laughs> bring people to the to to the suffering that that you've gone through to do this for us. But uh, we really appreciate, uh, uh, you know, giving us the time. And, uh, uh, you know, what a banker doing uh, writing a novel anyway? <laughs> well, I don't think if I was in the bank, I would have wrote a novel. Um, it was definitely when I left. And uh, it took a long time. It was about four years after banking. You know, it takes some time to get your creativity back after that kind of career. But I think um, what it was was... Um, I was one of the youngest financial advisors at 21. By 23, I was in head office working in strategy. And I guess I woke up one day and I'd had everything that I imagined I wanted and it still didn't feel like anything. So it was at that point then, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that that wasn't it. What inspired you to write? I mean, uh, choose fiction over uh, non-fiction. I mean, uh... yeah, I mean, I know writers do say it a lot, but I have always wanted to write. At school, through college, everything that I did was uh, in English and English literature, and uh, my A levels were in English. And it was only when um, I left the bank that I thought, what is the one thing I ha I do enjoy, and that is writing. And for me, the idea of it being fiction. Um, was to explore a different perspective of Palestine. If people want to learn about Palestine, uh, they can pick up a book, a non-fiction book, and learn all about it, but nobody ever does. My idea to do fiction was to open it up to another audience who enjoy reading and exploring, but who may not necessarily choose to learn about Palestine, or they might have ideas already about preconceived ideas about the occupation or what life is like it's in the media all the time so what I wanted to do is bring this new perspective and fiction allowed me the vehicle to do that to the widest audience possible. When you write a fiction and, and uh, based on uh, uh, actually experience reality by like going back to Palestine and going back to Jericho and you know you're going back to a, a painful reality uh, how did you separate yourself from that reality and uh, write your own novel? I think it's really difficult, especially uh, being having Palestinian heritage, to separate the two. But because when I initially went to Palestine, I didn't go with the intention of writing a book. I went um, to visit my family, to explore and... Everything that was captured there was very natural. It was through observation. It was through this unique perspective of, you know, being with family, being with the locals in the West Bank. So because it all came about very naturally, it wasn't like I went over specifically to research a book. So when I actually left Palestine, there was just a whole collection of stories from my uh, family, uh, from my sole survivor of day I've seen in my family, um, and there was so much I wanted to capture. And with Palestine's history being erased through the occupation, I didn't know what Palestine I would return to in a few years' time. And what I wanted to do was capture what I experienced at that moment, because it's ever-changing. If you pick up a map in Jerusalem now, um, you don't see uh, Palestinian towns that my family would recognise on there. You have people that can't ever go back to their towns because they don't exist. So it was really about capturing what I experienced from being in such a unique perspective in the West Bank. You lived uh, most of your, before that, you lived most of your life in, uh, in England. 
obtain the idea of identity, and I, yeah. I think you struggled with that uh, throughout the novel. Yeah, I mean, I think with um, I didn't associate myself at all with my Palestinian heritage. I mean, uh, when I was in the bank, I couldn't have told you where Palestine was. It was, you know, I I didn't know anything about it, um, and that was really the perspective that I was bringing over when I went to Palestine. In Palestine, I, I went with a very sort of British perspective, thinking everyone would uh, want to leave and live in England. And, um, you know, I didn't know anything about uh, the, the conditions under the occupation um, or the um, viewpoint of uh, Palestinians and Israelis. And I think that's what's new um, in respect to the book, is I was able to bring in a, a, a different um, vision of if you do meet somebody in London or where they're from or their religious background or their cultural background and what became apparent in Palestine was that that was really important, you know, are they Israeli, are you Palestinian, this identity that's created between the two just really doesn't exist um, in the UK. So what I wanted to explore was if you could perhaps separate this feeling between the two sides, um, would that make for a more hopeful future for the country? You were talking, I mean, the, the novel is, uh, talks about a relationship between uh, a daughter and a, and a missing uh, father, and also yeah. talk, talks about uh, a Palestinian and a missing country were passed. Uh, it also talks about you there as a, as a, a human being observing things. So there, there are different levels and, 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 and the way you draft it uh, with that kind of detail that you gave us, it was, it was really very intriguing uh, for me at least. So talk to us a little bit about uh, your actual relationship with your father. Um. It mirrors it in some ways, um, because there was um, no sort of exploration of my Palestinian heritage. That was something that came later. So again, for the um, religious side of it, I only started practicing Islam five years ago. So I'd say with the character, characters are always fictional. So even though you draw on some of your own experiences, for the sake of fiction, they are often elaborated or in more detail in order to get it across to the reader so he wasn't missing or i won't give too much away about the story but that wasn't him <laughs> it's a lot more exciting well, in the book. <laughs> he, he, read this, he did read the story right yes he's, what, what, he's a fan he, of the story i'm not sure he's read it all though i think i know he, i mean what was the reaction <laughs> what he what did he think uh he um he has the same reaction that um, a lot of uh, local Palestinians have, and that has been um, one that celebrates somebody visiting their country and loving it so much that they write about it and want to share that. And I think when you go there, what strikes you is everybody says, oh, come back, you know, come and see us, and they're so welcoming and so generous, and when you come back to them saying, well, I've been, and it's made such an impact on my life that I've wrote about it in a novel and I'm, you know, I'm trying to get it read by a Western audience. It's like my cousin said, it's, it's rare to have a contemporary novel set in occupied territories. So it, it, it was in a way like a, a time travel, but instead of to the future it was to the past. Yes. And, uh, there were, uh, looking for the missing father, actually, <clears throat> somehow they they find out more about themselves, not not what they are looking for to begin with. Yes, so, that's, that's exactly right. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how did you learn from this, and how did you find out about yourself as an actual uh, writer, and also how did the character. Uh, kind of uh, deal with that uh... yeah, about herself I think because the character is quite young and she goes through a lot of change that um, it was good to explore what you do search for and I did really relate to that with 
uh, heritage. I didn't completely associate myself as British. And I do think um, you can miss a lot of your culture. And I've had comments from people who say that they now want to explore the different cultures that make them because it does make you. And, and if you don't know about it, it's almost like something is missing. So this was very much my thoughts, but that was four years four years ago, and already I feel as though I've grown up, <laughs> she's grown up, <laughs> exploring what happens next with her. Um, so I don't feel that the character's over because it's changed so much for me and also for my character because she's in her early 20s. And it is that time of your life where things that you might think were important then no, would don't. change as you get older. Because it contains both sides it's been called Muslim um, it's been called Muslim fiction um, because it, it has an Islamic narrative which is something again that uh, my family and now I relate to um, so but I'm uncomfortable with it being always termed as such because I think the idea of being a great storyteller is that it should cross boundaries. And the whole reason that I wrote this book was to open up this perspective to the West. This isn't for people that can go to Palestine. This isn't for necessarily. This isn't for people who um, um, who have ideas that they don't want to explore. This is a story. And I think if you enjoy stories, then that's what I should be first and foremost, a storyteller. I think there's always difficulties with pigeonholing literature to a certain audience for a certain genre that has this effect of excluding it from people. I don't want people to think I'm not interested in Palestine, I'm not interested in um, uh, an Islamic narrative, I'm not a Muslim, this book isn't for me. Um, it's about wanting to experience something different. You know? It's interesting how timely, you know, your novel is and telling uh, you know the story of the Palestinians uh, uh, as human as, as yeah. so for someone used to Fox News or CNN or whatever uh, reading your novel will be I don't want to say a challenge but it will be a refreshing as you say yes and I think uh, that's the idea of literature everything is so dominated by the media that these stereotypes are just what people believe and that is one of the reasons I wrote the novel. We were, me and my husband were walking down the street in Jericho and um, never felt so safe. It's the kind of place where if you get lost and I say, yeah. where's my dad's house? They know where it is. It's been there for, for years and years and everybody knows each other. So I was really surprised when I saw a tourist bus pull up and it was completely blacked out all the tourists came off, they were surrounded by security, they took a photograph of a tree that Jesus, the Leo Hislam, was supposed to have slept under. Um, and then you had some Palestinian sellers, just trinkets, juices, coming over to them, and they were battered away by the security, piled back onto the bus and drove off. And what struck me at that moment was a lot of people want to go and see the Holy Land, they want to go and explore it, but they don't explore where they're on these these tours or these clinical visits and they're so terrified of actually being in the West Bank with Palestinians that it really is a unique perspective. <laughs> I mean you're not even couldn't sell them orange juice or you know anything because they were clearly worried. I mean why else are they surrounded by security? And it was really a shock because coming from London and commuting late at night, I certainly felt safer than I ever had in the West Bank. And I just felt at that moment they don't really truly get to explore the Holy Land. They don't get to explore the people, the rich history, the stories, because they're too scared. And if you log on to travel... Not just you broke, uh, you, as you say, you want to broke the boundary, you want to broke some of the pool. Uh, um, and Jasmine uh, had a relationship uh, with an Israeli. Uh, she, she goes to the country without these... Um, understanding the politics of such and she goes as a tourist and uh, she's helped by a mysterious stranger who some people are wary of and it does raise the question of 
you know, is it important? Do you have to know what religion they are or, you know, where they're, where they're from in order to establish how you feel about this person? Mm. And because Jasmine doesn't, she's allowed to create these uh, feelings before she finds out. Also, I mean, uh, uh, of the fact uh, Jasmine went back to Palestine and she was, uh, you know, kind of open, kind of uh, open to the experience itself, whatever that experience uh, threw at her and she dealt with it. Yes, uh, and that's why her, her character, um, it opens with her in England and not wanting to go there. She, she's very reluctant to return. Yeah. Um, she, her father's been missing for a decade and this is, she's forced to go back to get her inheritance. So otherwise, would Jasmine have gone to Palestine? Probably like a lot of my intended audience at the time, the answer to that is no. So yeah, she is going reluctantly and she's had a very, very different upbringing to one that you would have had completely if you were raised um, in another way as a Palestinian or as a Muslim. So she is able to do it somewhat naively. Mm -hmm. um, and that opens up uh, some more areas of exploring the character and also the conflict today didn't dwell much about the politics of their relationship. It was just two people who met the uh, place and time. Yes. I, I don't want to, again, create this, some controversy that gets books read about Palestine as well. Way, That's yeah. usually having a Romeo and Juliet-esque um, <laughs> uh, meeting between the two. But I didn't feel that that was the element I was trying to get across. I don't want to create controversy to sell the book. What I wanted to do is provide a more authentic experience so that you get a different perspective and it opens up the question for something much bigger than two people. Those letters that uh, in your novel uh, that you that she was... The, the letters are something that she finds in her dad's belongings. So she doesn't know the link between these but she's reading them from her father's belongings in the hope that they may Okay. Need to okay. <laughs> uh, kind of delicate, uh, beautiful, brilliant, poetic uh, way, and I, I like that uh, the imagery that you bring uh, that this uh, young uh, kid bring in as you know, you know, uh, teacher measure our faces, uh, our friends kick us. You know, it's a typical, uh, uh, you know, uh, kids' uh, stuff. Mother left off some week. And, uh, you know, as a kid, she, I don't want you to worry about this, Papa. I can catch rabbits. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, very, I, hard, very hard to do, to catch a rabbit. Even adults can do that. Yeah, I mean, you do it in survival, I think, you know, and how to yeah. do those things. Yeah. So, again, it was about another perspective. Um, uh, a lot of the Palestinian history comes from, um, you know, uh, from a, a Jewish perspective, from uh, fleeing wars, from fleeing uh, the World War, from leaving Germany. And I wanted to put that narrative in there as well, because that is an important composition of Palestinian history. So how I did that was through this series of letters so that it could just capture moments of that time period um, that in some ways are fundamental to Palestinians' past but also I think their future because Palestine was open to receiving uh, people who were fleeing the war and you know in in Jasmine's grandparents' time, they were living side by side with each other, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and they still do if you go to the, uh, the uh, more remote villages. We cannot leave this w without hearing you, <laughs> reading some of uh, your writing with your precious uh, accent. <laughs> I think I will add something to that. A selection from, um, as I said, a lot of the... Um, uh, the book captures other people's stories and other people's narratives. Um, so I'll read a, a small section about um, a Bedouin boy. 
And I'll start it, and then if it gets too long, just let me know. And I'll, and that's I'll, okay. Jasmine could not have known Khaled's fate. As the years ticked by after her first visit, Khaled's family had been restricted in their movements around the country. New Israeli settlements were built around their trails and barbed wire fences cut through the woods' open landscape. They weren't as imposing as the dense concrete blocks that cut up the holy city, but they proved efficient in preventing the Bedouin from roaming freely. Khaled had taken his family's herd of goats to their usual watering hole. When he reached the top, his throat was dry, so he crouched down near a stream and pressed his face into the water, drinking gulps until his thirst was satisfied. In his haste, he failed to see a carcass roll to the side of the water. He kicked over the body of the lynx. Its glassy eyes stared vacantly above, still unclouded and only recently dead. Khaled knew then he had made a fatal mistake. His tongue now sensed the powdery acid tang, which was the same taste the lynx would have had, only hers would have been heightened. The lynx hadn't been warned of the shadows that climbed down unsteadily from the hilltops under the cloak of the night sky. Khaled had. He would listen to his brother's stories as they sat out in the wilderness under the backdrop of the huge white moon. relationship between those fictional character after you finish uh, the novel do you still have an affinity relation or you just I think I do with with Jasmine uh, which is why I'm, I've already started writing the second book where yeah. she goes back to England because I think there's a lot more I can explore with the character uh-huh. um, with the other characters in the story um, yeah, I would definitely feel that there's an affinity there. There's hope. There's a lot of I- idealism. Um, and I would like to think that, you know, by having a different view from the youth is a potential hopeful solution for the future in Palestine. So I do, I am passionate about there being, uh, you know, young people reading it and, and feeling differently than perhaps they would do if, if they hadn't read the book in the first place. So yes, the, the relationship is ongoing, but it's, uh, it very much changes uh, as I do. And I, as the story unfolds, now I know a lot more about the country. And I think if I was to write the novel now, as opposed to beginning it four years ago, I probably wouldn't have created the same thing, because like everything, it, it changes with time and your experience of it. Well, we're looking forward uh, to the, the second one, and it would be interesting re-entering back to you know, Kingdom, and uh, sometimes it's harder to go back to the area where you were raised than going uh, uh, to a different place. Uh, so, Shireen Malhaba is a writer. Thank you, and uh, get well, and uh, appreciate uh, that he suffer quietly with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, You too. Well, the day. They came from a land that used to be called home. They came from a land that they lost. They came from Palestine. Claim a dream. A dream to have a piece of land to call home. My friend and I, we decided to have uh, a garden uh, and grow in the garden what uh, our grandparents and our parents grew in Palestine. I come from Lebanon. I was born in a refugee camp, and my parents um, come from Palestine from a village. Uh, the name of the village is Hattin, and it's a farming village. My parents were farmers, and uh, my parents uh, grew pretty much everything that. Uh, I'm growing right now. They grew tomatoes, corn, um, olive trees, um, cabbages, beans. Um, so I felt like I should continue what my parents and my uh, grandparents uh, grew in Palestine. Just a reminiscing, just a connection between that time and right now. 
And the only place for right now uh, that I can grow what my parents grew in Hattin is right here. Um, but it means a lot to me. A piece of land that they call home, where they celebrated the land day of Palestine. So if anybody want to eat, please. And today is uh, the harvest day. We're getting the, all our friends and uh, families to come and look at the lands and uh, so they can be connected with the land. Just the concept of land is very important to the Palestinians because we have not touched the land ourselves because we were refugees. I came from uh, from Jordan uh, via being uh, refugees and uh, Ahmad came from Lebanon, but we are essentially Palestinian people. And our kids are American uh, Palestinians, so they have not touched that uh, land concept. It's been a really good, friendly neighborhood, uh, neighbor relationship. We've never talked politics, uh, that just never entered into it. Well, we've learned so much yeah, yeah. Um, since we've been gardening out here. Being pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, it doesn't even matter if you consider the land to be theirs or mine. It's become less of a political issue than a humanitarian one. You can burn up our mosques in our homes and our schools, but our spirit will never die. We will not go down in God's Now he has a piece of land in Hastings, Minnesota that he calls home, that he plants and guarding as he wish. And he shared it with the community here, invited everybody to hear his story. The story of the land that he lost, the land that he's trying to reclaim here in America.